Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle, explorer in residence at the National Geographic, founder of Mission Blue, and I'm an ocean elder. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community from around the world on interesting topics of wonder and interest. I'm going to start screen sharing here. And that first image, ah, it's what we always start with. Just a big reminder that the world <clears throat> is blue. blue. <laughs> I'll never forget <laughs> it. And before we really dive in, just a bit of housekeeping, because we do have attendees from all over the world who want to participate today. Uh, later on in the show, we are going to take questions and answers and make answers <laughs> to as many questions as we can. Um, you can put them into the Q&A box or if you want to speak to us live, you can use the raise your hand uh, bar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And our producer, co-producer Arnold, will call on you. And please note throughout the conversation, there will be some um, links posted in the chat box as well for you to reference. So let's dive in. Let's do it. Now, some people say, it's raining. We can't go diving. And I say, it wet is wet. Wet is wet. And you and get a freshwater rinse after. <laughs> <laughs> don't need to go shower because you get you get it as a gift. That's exactly right. I love diving in the rain. The ceiling is all wrinkly when it rains. It's beautiful. So today we are going to be continuing Sharktober. And we are going to have, those are conversations with uh, the people who study sharks and about sharks in general. Today we are going to have a uh, a whole group of guests. They are the founders of MISS, the Minorities in Shark Science. MISS. Yes. So um, don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be joined by Carly Jackson, Jasmine Graham, Jada Elcock, and Imani Weber Schultz. So, ladies, welcome. Dive in with us. Hey, haha. -ha. There they all are. <laughs> so, I've read that the four of you met over Twitter. Um, what what led you to uh, move from just collaborating, being collaborating scientists, to forming a nonprofit? Anybody want to take that one? I'll take that one. Uh, so we yes, we found each other on Twitter through a hashtag. And for those of you who don't know, a hashtag is basically just a thing that you use that you can search and you can find other people that have tagged their tweet with that thing. And so we all were tweeting for Black and Nature, and we all had these really cool photos of us in the field. And we kind of discovered, oh, wait a minute, you're a shark scientist. What? <laughs> I'm a shark scientist. Hey. Um, and so it was super cool and super exciting because we all kind of felt isolated prior to that because we all felt like we were the only Black women in shark science. And then suddenly there were a bunch of people and it was really exciting. And so we wanted to be able to give that same feeling to a lot of different people. And so we started Miss as a way to kind of come together and collect just a lot of voices that were feeling isolated and show people that you're not alone. And so it started out as a joke on Twitter of we should start a club. And then we decided <laughs> to actually make it a real thing. And here we are with a nonprofit with 160 members from 15 different countries. So we've come a long way from our joke. That's outstanding. I love it. And the fact that we're looking at young women who yeah. are even more of a minority in the greater scheme of things for science, that's changing to the benefit of the world. So it, sh it shouldn't matter. Gender really? shouldn't matter, <laughs> except maybe women see things others do not. <laughs> That's right. A little more intuitive sometimes. <laughs> so Jasmine, you are focused on working with the, the uh, sawfish and the hammerhead sharks, and they're at Moat Marine Laboratory. Oh, no, wait. Jeannie Clark, the founder. You never Did you ever get to meet Jeannie? I didn't. I did not. That is the great tragedy of my life. Just missed her. Um, but 
Yeah, I, she definitely was someone that inspired me whenever I was in college. When I first got interested in shark science, I read all of the biographies on her and was always super excited. And so it was always my dream to work at Moat. And then it's really exciting that I actually ended up being able to work at Moat. So that's really cool. I don't think a lot of people get to uh, make their dreams come true like that, the way that I did. So I'm very thankful to have found my way to Moat and be part of the Moat family. And then also my role at Moat, I'm the project coordinator for this grant that's focused on increasing access to marine science and broadening participation in marine science. And so I get to work a lot with all of the different research uh, groups within MOAT to bring community college students and students from underrepresented minority groups to MOAT to do projects and learn about marine science. And I get to teach people how to mentor students and teach students how to be good mentees and facilitate all of these great connections that will hopefully lead people to really successful careers in marine science. So I'm fulfilled in all aspects with my job at Moat. I, I think that connecting with Jeannie through her books and now of course through the institution that she started, I was lucky that she took me under her flipper when I was at about your, the stage of my life at, as you are now, a um, teenager actually, and really made a difference and she's still making a difference. And I hope you will also do just what you're doing, I guess, pass it along, share your passion, your love and bring the next generation or anybody. It, you know, people of any age need to be brought up to speed. We're learning so much so fast. And I was, and I was also, uh, you know, reading a little bit about Carly and and the impact that you know books had for her as when when she was young and just kind of starting off and and being inspired at the library <laughs> finding books yeah. about sharks it got to me <laughs> yeah definitely always had my head in a shark book growing up in <laughs> Detroit Michigan there's not a lot of ocean anywhere <laughs> better to have um, your head in the book than in, in the shark <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's, it's so funny because, you know, one of our previous episodes, we had the whale artist uh, Wyland, and who also grew up in Detroit, a kind of yeah. landlocked area. But What is it about Detroit? I know. Yeah. Oh, it's river adjacent, it's river adjacent right? We've got the <laughs> Great Lakes around. Lake us, adjacent, pretty cool. yeah. <laughs> Leads to the ocean, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons we often will be doing our um, kind of our broadcasts here from the library, from the den, oh, yeah. and just really mm -hmm. trying to you know celebrate books. And there's so much to learn about the you know the past and what's gone on with sharks over the years um, by going back and looking at those records. Yeah. Um, so what is it about sawfish that that just makes them so cool? Um, you know, I, they I look like dinosaurs. They do, and I don't <laughs> even think that people think of sawfish as even being related to to sharks. Right. but um or even know they exist yeah <laughs> yes most people don't know they exist so we recently had international sawfish day for those of you that don't know international sawfish day happens every year on october 17th so we just passed it and i got to stand out at moat with my booth teaching people about sawfish and people either knew that it was international sawfish day or had never heard of a sawfish there was no in between <laughs> <laughs> and sawfish are really unique animals. First of all, they have a giant saw on their face. What's up with that? That's just right. bizarre, just bizarre anatomy that happens. Some people uh, they're also some really sharks, interesting I think, rays. Because it looks like a big saw. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a big saw. Yeah. Hence the name sawfish. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, their saw is really incredible. So not only is it uh, has these defense abilities with the teeth. Uh, they use it for hunting. They also have the sensory organs on the bottom of it so they can actually sense their prey as they're swimming over. And it's just, it's a really unique structure that serves a lot of purposes. And whenever sawfish are born, they have this little gelatinous sheath <laughs> over their teeth so they don't hurt their mother because sawfish <laughs> are born live. Ooh, and wow. who give birth to a chainsaw literally no one 
<laughs> That's adorable. Yeah. So what's the biggest one you've ever seen? Uh, the biggest one I've ever seen had, was about the four beat. and a half meters. Wow. Um, and yeah, they get pretty big. So the small tooth sawfish, the species that I study, they max out at about 16 feet in length or five meters. And so they, they get to be pretty large, but they're not even the largest species among the sawfish. Uh, so they are pretty incredible. Usually whenever I tell people that sawfish exist, they're kind of like, wow. And then they ask how big they get and I give them the answer and they go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're so, so incredible. Just, they really are. If you had, it looks like, I don't know, you couldn't, you can't make this stuff up. No, if, if, if you just imagine such a creature, you'd say, no, can't be. But there they are. Yeah. And the hammerheads. They too are so improbable. Yeah. It's just another really interesting adaptation um, that I, I don't even really think we know that much about, you know, why they have this shape, you know. I think yeah, the hammerheads are another group of animals that I've studied. I have a thing about weirdly shaped animals. I really <laughs> dig them. Like so all of my research is focused on animals that have weird shapes, hammerheads, sawfish. <laughs> and uh, I just think that they're really cool. And so I was interested in this question of what, what's up with their heads. And so I studied the evolutionary history of hammerheads to try and figure that out because we don't even know how they evolved these heads. And I still don't have an answer for you. So sorry about that. Sometimes science right. gives it's you more questions. More, and I'm still more research, yeah. And, and Carly, you've been doing, I keep seeing all these pictures cropping up where you've been studying the nurse sharks in particular. Um, <laughs> I love them. They're just so cute. They really are. And, you know, your description of them um, as smiling is really spot on. It, yes. Uh, and their it, little mouths at the bottom. And their little barbells, too, look like barbell. little smiling mustaches. <laughs> it was a nurse shark that Jeannie Clark took to the emperor of Japan as a gift, oh a trained one. A trained one. <laughs> People think, oh, sharks are really dumb. They're, they have such a tiny brain, but no. <laughs> whatever they've got, they really use the make, the make the best of it. And she actually, not only with nurse sharks, but with a number of different species, trained them to respond to symbols and even colors that were lowered into the tank where the sharks were kept mm -hmm. and respond to food. Mm -hmm. And it was quite remarkable. So she took this little young um, nurse shark, flew it to Japan in a special tank, <laughs> and the little shark performed for the emperor. It was a nice story. Wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. I had no idea. I didn't know about that story. <laughs> oh yeah. well, check it out. I definitely will. <laughs> you know, when I was when I was really small, you know, when Sylvia was, you know directing the then the Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory, I used to be sent out to play with the nurse sharks as a kid. So, <laughs> that sounds like a fun job. Oh my God. <laughs> they had these holding tanks for them and, you know, she'd be doing her work and she'd go, go play with the nurse sharks. And, and they were, they're great babysitters, you know. Yes, they <laughs> look are. At these oh, look at their, oh, they're just so cute. Their flappy pectoral fins are just my yeah. favorite feature on them. Yeah. They're, they really, really smiley, gentle. the smiling well, sharks. You, you think of them as gentle and harmless, but there's a place near the Cape Hayes, then the, the Moat Marine Laboratory, called Point of Rocks. And there were some people out there messing around, diving, just snorkeling. And there was a nurse shark minding its own business, its face tucked under a rock, just peacefully being a shark. And this kid, you know, what do you know? It was a guy. Pull the tail. Pull the tail. Pull the tail. Why? The oh tail. my gosh. That's always how it starts. That's where right? it goes downhill with me. Bad. Bird, so. yep. Don't pull the tail of a shark or a dog. Yeah. No. <laughs> Haul the poor shark out. And what did the shark do? It whipped around and bit the diver's tail. Um, I yeah. like that. Yeah. And he wouldn't. He got him, him back. Yeah. <laughs> Had to go to the hospital, actually. That's, wow, that's impressive. And, well, the worst thing with the nurse shark, getting bit by a nurse shark is they use the the way they eat is buccal pumping, so they'll suck it in. So it's like 
the strength of, I think I read somewhere it's like five vacuums it's, or <laughs> even more than that is imagine having that on your butt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it probably took a while for them to get that shark off of him. Yeah. Dice it on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Not much in the way of teeth, but no, it's still like the way it lat yeah, it like latches on after they suck on and yeah, you're not gonna have a good time. Yeah. Is so, this is this one of Amos's photographs? No, this is just one that okay. someone submitted to us, but it's not They're a so pretty. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> little guys. And this, this is, is how you usually see it, right? Too. Kind of, sometimes just the tail. Just the tail, or just <laughs> like kind of like like hang out hanging out underneath the rock like this. And as you were saying that they don't they're one of the sharks that can kind of rest like this without really having to move around a lot um, in order to move water uh, over their gills. Exactly. Yeah, it's called buccal pumping. So they use their cheek muscles. A lot of um, like uh, benthic sharks can do this. They just use their cheek muscles to forcefully suck in water um, Mm -hmm. and move it past their gills. They don't have to keep swimming. So they can take a nap without worrying about breathing. (laughs) Yeah, it just happens. Exactly. (laughs) And I know that, um, you know, Carly and, and Jada both grew up in, in pretty landlocked areas. We were talking about that a little bit before. And what is the role that you see as, uh, you know, these public aquariums uh, having in order to get kids really um, engaged with ocean wildlife? Yeah, I would say that they are so incredibly important. I mean, I lived in Illinois, so, you know, kind of close to the Great Lakes, but then when I was 10, I moved to Arizona. So I was nowhere near really any body of water. So living in the middle of the desert and wanting to work with sharks is not really, definitely not a match made in heaven. So um, I looked for opportunity when I found out that Odyssey Aquarium was opening in Scottsdale. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to check this place out. They have an internship, this is wonderful. Um, So I applied and I got accepted for an internship there. And it was just an amazing experience. I got to work with so many different types of teleosts, a ton of different elasmobranchs, I got to work with with tons of different species of sharks, and I also got to work with some sea turtles, which was really awesome. But um, to talk a little bit about the the target feeding, that was something that I had some experience with. You know, um, getting the sharks to you know come to their specific target, That's and true. my specific intern project was actually training um, three guitar fish, giant guitar oh. fish, to target feed. Um, which, if you don't know, these guitar fish are a species of ray. They look kind of like the sawfish, but instead of a saw, it's a shovel. Um, <laughs> they're so cute. I love them. Um, and yeah, I got that was my intern project. I got to train them. They are so incredibly intelligent. And in a matter of probably two weeks, as soon as you put the target in the water, they make a beeline for that target because they know it's food time. So anyone that says that fish are not smart are wrong. They are super, super smart and just honestly, such amazing animals to work with. So having that aquarium experience was essential to being able to get some experience with some ocean animals. So the 10 year olds who are listening in know what a teleost is and they know what an elasmobranch is, but I bet all the grown ups don't know. So could right. you- <laughs> yes. So teleosts are uh, what we think of as like your bony fish. So, you know, finding Nemo, you've got Dory, you've got Nemo. Um, those are your teleosts, but elasmobranchs are sharks, skates, and rays. Um, skates, if you don't know, look a lot like rays, but they're a little bit different. There's a few differences, but um, that's that's the difference. And the, the main difference is teleosts, like I said, bony fish, they have bones. Elasmobranchs do not. Their skeleton is made entirely out of cartilage. So those are the difference between those two groups. And so we see so many of the, you know, the fossil records of just the shark's teeth. No. Or, or the, you know, there'll be like the, the stingray scrapers that can be fossilized as well, but the, the um, cartilage doesn't fossilize that. Well. No, yeah. no. So it's a, it's an interesting thing, but you know, I, I volunteered for many years at the original Steinhardt Aquarium, and it's the same kind of thing. You know, we really begin to look at fish as individuals there. Um, yeah. Even, even things like the little freshwater archer fish, they would see me and they knew that I was going to, you know, put up a, a target with food on it for them. And they just line up, you know. <laughs> and you were nice to them. Not not everybody was nice to them. That's true. I mean, I took care of all kinds of different fish there, and and um, there was a a Queensland grouper named uh, Ulysses, and he would he would sit there and you know kind of make these big thumps and thumps like they do, 
but he he recognized certain people that he didn't like and he would immediately just take a mouth of water and just hose them off um <laughs> anytime they came past the tank and, and a couple of people would just completely avoid the entire area because they knew that they were going to take a, a dousing from this fish um <laughs> <laughs> and you know and i'd go to, to look at him and check him out he'd roll over on his side open up his mouth and you know want to be scratched like a just like a big dog um i found the sharks are very much that well that way too and the smaller sharks particularly were were pretty easy to um to train they would come right over and and want to be fed and and then we had the experience sometimes of a, a much bigger shark something like a thresher shark that uh, would be inadvertently caught and brought into stress to the aquarium, but we were able to to walk the sharks um, and get them, you know, back in good good health, and then and then have the release them, be able to yeah. release them. Yeah. So you know, just the that ability of empathy, this, have the empathy. With but them. having the aquariums um, is such a gift, uh, and we get a lot of people on these shows that have asked us questions. You know, I'm in a landlocked state. What can I do? How <laughs> can I get interested in in uh, ocean science? So it's great to see. Yeah, I would also say aquariums are a great way to kind of get the idea that fish have super different personalities the same way cats and dogs do, as you were yeah. mentioning. Like, it's so clear that, you know, they either like you or they don't, or they're they're all about food, or some of them are just like, oh, I'll come get my food when I'm ready for it. You know, it's, it's very clear that they have very different personalities. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't realize. And I think it's also a really important thing um, for people to, you know, kind of get to know the animals more and really feel that, like that connection with them, that they really do have personalities. They're not just some thing in the ocean, you know? Not yeah. something to serve with lemon butter. <laughs> Swimming in butter. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you like our sharks alive. Yeah, yeah, people ask, what's your favorite fish? They say a live one. <laughs> That's great. It's true of all of them. Okay, so why are we showing you guys mud? <laughs> this is all Imani's fault. Uh, you know, we were reading about how she started off looking at uh, little foraminifera in the mud, little bits of plankton. And these are not fist-sized rocks. These are microscopic. They're just tiny, like grains of sand. So, Imani, how did you make this leap from <laughs> looking at these tiny little... That's a live oh, one. It's here's a live one. Beautiful. Pseudopods. But these aren't sharks. But how did you how did you do this? <laughs> how did you sleep? <laughs> oh, yeah, it is quite a jump. Um, so I my freshman year of college, I started working in a paleoceanography lab, which for those who don't know, paleoceanography is basically looking at the geologic past through different things like ocean circulation, biology, geology, chemistry, those sorts of things. Um, and in that lab, she studies for I can never say this word correctly. I always say foraminifera, and I don't think it's how you say it. Because that's the first way I heard it. Forams. <laughs> Just call them forams. Forams. There we go. Um, she uses forams to study what the climate was, you know, like millions of years ago. Um, and it's it was super interesting to me. And it was just the first lab experience that I got. So I worked with her for all four years. But my junior year of college, I found a scholarship to this place called Field School in Miami where they do an intro to shark research course and you basically go on their boat and you live on their boat for a week and you help them with their shark research so you learn how to do tags you learn how to take muscle samples and total lengths and you watch them pull get the sharks on the platform and do all those super cool workups and after that week I was like this is awesome <laughs> I need to be doing this um, <laughs> yeah and so then after that I kind of just made it my mission to find people who were had been in shark research or currently in shark research um and then I just kind of got my foot in the door that way um Flipper. but even though it wasn't related to sharks it was it's useful to have lab experience no matter what oh, absolutely and that's valuable in any area even if it's not related so it was it was quite a jump but I enjoyed both of I enjoy both of them um forums are super cool and they're so pretty under a microscope there's so many different shapes of their shells and it's so cool that's well, a great it's a great leap across and and so glad that you're uh, in with the sharks now <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> but, but still i mean that like you're saying that that ability to um, take one body of training and then being able to apply it across different disciplines is is really yeah. critical in the sciences everything connects it all really connects. 
and being able to look at these, you know, one fossil record with the little the forams and then looking at the shark's teeth in the fossil records and, and all the other um, aspects that just kind of all tie together and help us really build a story about what's going on with climate, what's, what's changed, what's been lost over time, and how we can uh, hopefully improve the situation. Right. Yep. Everything is important, even if it's smaller than a grain of sand. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think the, that your collective effort in forming uh, MISS is really going to help in that regard, too, to get, you know, more people uh, that feel like, you know, maybe they never have a chance to, to study science, let alone shark science. But you know, it's really taking a leadership role to um, help people take the take the jump, take the leap. Yeah, people... and. It's easy to find, make an excuse for why you can't do something. But to see all of you just turn it around, you say, well, why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dive in. Yeah, exactly. Figure it out. <laughs> so last last week in Florida, uh, you know, there's this news article that came out, again, you know, circling back around to the, to the sawfish. Um, but, you know, this happened, oh, you know. People. And th these little guys were all found down in the Everglades, and some had their their saws chopped off, and other ones were just kind of left abandoned like this. Um, Actually, the that saw has been the cause for, in large part, one of the reasons that they have really they become endangered. These found for a very long time, geologically speaking, but because they're curiosity, if you go to some places that sell animal parts. Shells and so forth. Yeah, they often have a, the saw just lopped off. People don't even know what, what it, it was attached to, but it's it's such an exotic looking thing. But that and also bottom trawling, mm -hmm. because these t creatures tend to live on the bottom because that's where they feed. Um, a trawl that goes across the ocean floor snatches them up and so many have been killed that way. They also will take bait on a long line. Mm -hmm. So they're even though they're, they're not people don't intend to catch them, they're part of the cost of doing doing business, if you will. So many creatures die as a consequence of 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 fishing. Yeah, uh, un, unintentional. Unintentional. Yeah. So is is uh, is Miss working with? the you know local community on this on this uh, investigation or is moat working on this investigation so i um study sawfish and and so i do a lot of outreach work with the sawfish recovery team who's really spearheading the effort to try and find uh the culprits who who did this i mean taking six of an endangered a critically endangered species that's i mean that's I can't think of anything worse uh, than, you know, just mindlessly killing six critically endangered animals. Um, so there's a there's a big reward being offered right now for information. There's been an organization that put up an extra five thousand dollars for the reward. So now it's up to twenty five thousand dollar reward for information. Excellent. And so we're hoping that someone someone knows something. Um, and so if anyone happening to be on this webinar knows something, please call and report us, yeah. report, report to us uh, what, what you know. And um, in general, if you catch a sawfish accidentally or you see one, you're one of those lucky people that's out paddle boarding or walking through the mangrove shorelines and you see one, please call the sawfish recovery team, 1-8444-SAWFISH. And uh, we collect all of that data that helps us know where they are, when they're, where they're spending a lot of time. And we need data to protect them. We need to know where they are so we can protect their critical habitats. Uh, we need to know where they are so that we can limit fishing in those areas. We need to know all of these things to be able to make policy decisions that help support the growth and recovery of the sawfish population. So any information that anyone can give us is really helpful and seeing things like this is a huge tragedy and we're trying to get out there spread the word educate people of how critically endangered these animals are how important they are to our ecosystem and hopefully encourage people 
to think before they just mindlessly slaughter a, a species that's barely hanging on. Well, yeah. they mean us no harm. They're innocent. It's like it, all sharks, really, you know, yeah. like even even the ones that get, you know, accused bad of rap. bad rap, yeah. accused of attacking, attacking people, attacking swimmers. You know, it's yes. it's typically an accident. You know, and, it's a mistaken it, identity. It's the sharks who have to worry about us. Exactly. <laughs> but I think that, again, you know, through your organization, you really have the opportunity to reach people who might not normally be you know, reached about the importance of sharks and and particularly animals like these sawfishes that um, are just they're, just, they're a miracle. They are a miracle. <laughs> um, so it's so important, such important work. Now, Sylvia always says no child should be left dry. Yeah, no grown up either. <laughs> no grown ups either. <laughs> but Carly, uh, I read that you did competitive swimming in college. Uh, how did you how did you get involved or how did all of you get involved in in just in getting access to the water and swimming and diving in particular yeah so i actually had started swimming when i was about five years old i always naturally had a like i was one of those kids who would jump in the water even though i didn't know how to swim and my parents <laughs> would be like stop what are you doing they're like all right we got to get her in some swim lessons because <laughs> this is too yeah. much but yeah, so I immediately like loved the water. And then the person taught me swim lessons was like, you're going to be a swimmer. So, you know, and like, that's not very common in places like Detroit, where there's a lot of minority children, like black children, for sure, who don't have access to the water. And I think it's really important, no matter even where you go to learn how to swim, because one, it's a life saving thing, you just never know when you're going to be near a body of water and might accidentally fall in. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to be able to get in the water, get your feet wet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> dive in. Exactly. Dive in. I, yeah. I definitely agree. I am just like Carly. I was always in love with the water, jumping in, even though I didn't know how to swim and my mom <laughs> having to save my life all the time. <laughs> But uh, I later became a competitive springboard diver because oh. it's a different sense of diving in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it was so much fun. And I think that that's part of what drove me to want to become a marine biologist, even though I lived in the desert, just because I was like, okay, the water is where I feel so comfortable. And it's yeah. even if you don't know where you your career might take you, something as simple as like having a pool or you know learning learning how to swim or being on the swim team can really kind of like steer you towards something like that um which is what happened for me so and like carly said learning how to swim is definitely like just a survival skill um i know people that are like let's go out on a rowboat and i'm like but you don't know how to swim like that's not a good idea they don't even have a life jacket <laughs> right exactly so i think just being in the water can really help you potentially get a feel for you know a a career field that you might be interested in and also just because it's a safe thing to do to just know how to be around the water and how to be safe. Yeah, yeah definitely. And it gives you access to most of life on earth. Yeah. I mean, I love all the creatures on the land as well, but the action is really out there in the blue part. It's true in ponds and lakes and streams, but it's really true of the ocean. <laughs> but it's it's one of these things that you know, for me, it just kind of makes me crazy to see how hard it can be at times just to get basic access to clean water, clean water, to, <laughs> you know, or even any water <laughs> where people can can really feel that they can take their families and that they can get kids in the water yeah. and, and get, them, get the, you know, throw a face mask on them, just start to to get comfortable in the water. And it's it's something that, you know, I think that um, we could really use a lot more advocacy around just to try to get people engaged and, and get them to, you know, just put on that face mask and, and have a look, you know, see, see those nurse sharks, see those, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, just... the face mask is the number one piece of equipment because being able to see comfortably when you're underwater really changes everything. If you're, yeah, even when you're, even when I swim just for swimming, I like to use a face mask. I go down and I look at the drain. I look at, you know. <laughs> Leaves on the bottom of the pool, things of this sort. 
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I think, Jasmine, you're going to take us through a series of your uh, slides. Let's see if I can With actually manage to show, stop sharing here. And then, here we go. And then we'll, uh, after we go through your slides, then we're going to go to our question and answer. Great, so uh, we just have a couple of photos to show you just so you get to know a little bit more about us. We've kind of talked a little bit about our stories, but I uh, started out, like I said, studying hammerhead sharks because I'm into weirdly shaped animals, that's my thing. <laughs> and so I was looking at the evolution of hammerhead sharks and I got to do some really cool things with them. I got to CT scan them and do digital segmentation, which is basically like doing a dissection on the computer. And so I made these uh, 3D models like you see on the left there uh, to look at their anatomy in a way that uh, didn't require me sacrificing an animal. So I used museum specimens and was able to CT scan them and not damage the specimens and return them back to the museum for someone else to use. Uh, so this is a really great sustainable way to be looking at anatomy. And that was really cool. I also looked at their DNA and was looking at all of the different ways that you could trace the, fa the family, the hammerhead family, and uh, figure out who's related to who. A lot of people don't realize there are actually 10 different species of hammerheads. There's a lot more hammerheads out there. If you ask the average person, they usually guess less than five, but there's actually a ton of hammerheads out there. Super cool. And uh, so that's why the group that I started working with, and then I transitioned over to sawfish, another weirdly shaped animal, because I was really interested in conservation. I loved doing my evolutionary work, but I really wanted to do something that was going to have an impact where I could actually go and change something, make something better for some animal. And so I started studying the critically endangered small tooth sawfish. And I do a tagging study where I track their movements. So here you can see me downloading receivers. And uh, so I do a lot of that, do a lot of tagging. So we catch uh, sawfish, tag them and release them. And then we track where they move using these little receivers that are all around Florida. And so we go dive down, dive in uh, and go get these receivers, pull them up and download the data from them and then we redeploy them and uh, they sit on the bottom and they just listen to hear whenever a sawfish swims by. And so that's something that's really cool. And like I mentioned, I work a lot with Tanya Wiley on the sawfish recovery team, as well as my former advisor, Dr. Dean Grubbs. And I do outreach events like you see here. Here's us with our cute little photo booth uh, <laughs> sign. Uh, encouraging people to report when they see sawfish, just educating people about sawfish and how important they are and getting people excited about them. Because if you get a whole bunch of people excited about an animal, then you put pressure on policymakers and politicians and things to actually do things to protect those animals. So getting yep. buy-in from the public is really essential to saving species. And so I do a lot of that work where we go to booths and we talk to the public and it's just really fun to share how much I love sawfish and get other people on board. So excellent. that's kind of my story and what I do. <laughs> All right. And what's next? You're, 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 there we go. Okay. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I said, in my undergrad, I worked on forums and then I went to field school, which is what the majority of these pictures are from. And I learned how to handle them, um, how to draw blood from them, which is the picture all the way on the left. Um, and other things like taking muscle samples, um, restraining them during a workup. And I've enjoyed that a lot. And that's what I did the last um, year and a half year, last year of my undergrad. And right now I'm doing a fellowship with them. Uh, while I'm applying to grad school for next year. So it's a year long fellowship and I get to help them run their courses. And I also get to do an independent research project as well. And then my senior year on top of shark stuff and working on forums, I also worked with Dr. Brooke Fleming at the New Jersey Institute of Technology where she specializes in biomechanics and functional morphology. And so I helped her with 3D modeling of remoras, 
which for those who don't know, remoras are those fish that you almost always <laughs> see sticking onto sharks and whales and marlin. Yeah. And they have this modified dorsal fin on the top, which is a disc that allows them to essentially suction on to all these super fast animals. Um, and they're super cool and they're also really cute uh, <laughs> in person. They're super Great. cute. <laughs> um, and they don't get a lot of attention because they're always attached to cool species like sharks. And then you have this <laughs> tiny fish that has all these crazy things about them that nobody knows. Yeah. Uh, so I spent some time doing that and I'm still doing a research assistant in her lab doing that as well. It's an awesome fish to study too. Aha. Uh -huh. What's here? going on here? Oh, it's me. Yeah, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I do, I work with both sharks and sea turtles. So I get the best of both worlds. I know it's Sharktober, but shout out to my sea turtles. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess I'll quickly say in the very top right picture, um, I work at a place called Gumbo Limbo Nature Center. Gumbo Limbo is a tree, just so you know. And um, we, I work on the marine sea turtle specialist team. So we monitor the beach during sea turtle nesting season. Um, and I also work in our rehab facility. So we have a sea turtle hospital where we rescue rehab and uh, hopefully release those turtles back out in the wild um, and this one particular turtle is my absolute favorite turtle that I've ever worked with her name was Euphorbia and she was a <laughs> she was attacked by a shark um, and you can see the vet is there just like stitching it up and apparently since I work out and I'm kind of strong I apparently was the one to get on top of this turtle so that she wouldn't <laughs> give the vet a hard time. She still gave us a hard time, but I tried my best. Um, but yeah, so the main research that I do uh, with sharks is looking at the effects of tourism on uh, nurse sharks. So my master's research uh, focused on a group of nurse sharks in Belize. And then that bottom middle picture, that's me doing some field work. So I went to Belize, uh, an island called Key Calker, and I looked at the effects of provisioning tourism. So feeding tourism, boats would go out to this area and just put a lot of food in the water and like 30 nurse sharks would just come out of nowhere and just wow. eat all the food and the tourists would get in the water, take pictures. So it was kind of like a, um, like a shark amusement park, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And um, so yeah, I looked at the effects on their physical uh, bodies, their behavior, their abundance, and how attracted they were to the boats. Um, and I found a lot of cool stuff, a lot of interesting stuff. They basically, the boat engine was the sound of a dinner bell for these sharks. So whenever, Thanks. yeah, so whenever a boat literally just pass by the area you could see all the sharks like oh there's food is there food like just swimming around and um unfortunately that led to a lot of issues so because they were so in tune to the boat engine they would swim really close to the boat propellers because that's where the food would be getting thrown out of so some of the sharks did have boat propeller marks on their oh, bodies yeah. and yeah and on their um on their fins so that was definitely a big negative effect that i found um they were just so used to the sound of the boat meaning food that they kind of just would get really close to the propellers and unfortunately get hit but um but yeah so their behavior was really interesting they would swim around a lot when there was a lot of boats in the area and then they would rest um after the boats left but also with nurse sharks, they are naturally nocturnal. So during the day, they're supposed to be um, like that one picture, like tucked up under a rock. <laughs> that's usually, right. when, yep, that's whenever you go diving and you see a nurse shark, usually it's the tail of a nurse shark, <laughs> like because it just jammed don't itself it. up under a rock. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't pull it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these nurse sharks are doing the complete opposite of what um, nurse sharks are supposed to be doing. So, yeah. Yeah, and I also do a lot of tagging work. That's what that other picture to the left is. Um, yeah, and I also do some work with field school, just like Imani did uh, or does. Excellent. So, so yeah. Oh, and these are some cool videos. So this is what it would look like, the very top corner. Um, that's what it would look like when the fishermen would, or not the fishermen, the tour guides would throw food in the water um, and then that's when all the tourists would get in the water and just start taking pictures with the sharks and seems really cool, but you know, <laughs> not the best yeah. thing for these guys. Yeah, um, and then 
not normal for them to be out in the daytime like that. Exactly. And yeah. also just um, the way they're swimming at the surface, you know, nurse sharks are benthic animals. So they're usually at the bottom, <laughs> like chilling on the bottom or eating off the bottom. Um, but with this, they're eating from the surface. And like I said, that's just creating all types of physical problems for them, unfortunately. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and yeah, that bottom video was them like trailing a boat because they were so used to that. Like the boat to them is food. So they're just like, are you going to give me food? Yeah. 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 Pied Piper. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello, my turn. Um, awesome. So <laughs> um, I worked with when I was at Friday Harbor Labs for an internship, actually the last two summers, uh, which was an amazing experience. I love Friday Harbor Labs. Um, I got to work with skate egg cases. Um, and like I said before, skates are similar to stingrays. They look very similar. Um, one of the main differences is that all stingrays give live birth, but all skates lay eggs. Um, and so I got to work with these egg cases and you can see me holding up a picture of one of those egg cases right there. Um, also known as mermaid purses because it looks right. just like a purse. Um, and so I got to do some awesome work with those. Um, I guess before I get into that, I will talk about these other two pictures. So the top picture is me at Odyssey Aquarium in their uh, Sea Trek exhibit where you can put on like these helmets and go down um, and see the animals. And there were so many cow nosed rays that were so excited to see everybody. They're so, so sweet animals. I love them so much. That was an amazing experience. I loved it. Um, and that picture down on the bottom left is me as a lab technician at Howard um, in DC. And I was clear and staining some sharks, some fetal sharks. Unfortunately, I went home. Well, not unfortunate that I went home for my brother's wedding, but unfortunate that I couldn't go back because COVID kind of prevented me oh, from yeah. going back to Howard. So I didn't get to finish my clearance staining, which was kind of a bummer, but I know someone else is going to finish it and they're going to turn out awesome. So that's exciting. Um, these egg cases were super awesome to work with because um, when I was at the aquarium, I had the chance to work with uh, sharks and stingrays, but then I finally got to do some work with skates um, at Friday Harbor. So what we were looking at is um, the textures or microstructures on the surface of these egg cases um, because they differ by different species and the shape of the egg cases are also different by species. So we were trying to figure out what exactly um, contributes to how well different species egg cases stick to the substrate. So that we know- shows Yeah, I think you've got a slide of that, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah, the next slide are these uh, microstructures. So. Yeah. Here are the different species that I was looking at. I looked at eight different species, six of which oh. came from Alaska and two of which were out in the Salish Sea here in uh, Washington. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so cool to see how different the microstructures are. Um, and some of them are incredibly smooth, like these two on the top left um, and the most rough ones are down on the bottom right. So yeah. it was super cool to see how different the, not only the, the larger structure was, but the microstructures. And so we took these SEM, scanning electron microscopy images, um, to get a better look at what the different species microstructures looked like. Um, and then we took that and measured in a flume, like a giant water tunnel, <laughs> how this, the speed at which they would break away from substrate. So we put them on uh, some sandpaper and turned on the water tunnel and incrementally up the speed and whenever they fell off, we were like, okay, this is about as much as they can take. And so it's like um, the hydrodynamics of the AK. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's super cool because what we saw was we're seeing a lot of uh, nursery sites, like where they're laying all these egg cases out in uh, Alaska, but we can't find any in the Salish Sea. And we know that the egg cases are there because we've caught them there. And we know that the skates are there. So we have no idea where the egg cases are coming from, but they have to be coming from somewhere. Right. So um, we found that all of them could withstand the like maximum or I guess average speeds out in uh, the Bering Sea in Alaska, but not a single one could withstand the average speed out in the Sailor Sea. So oh. we're thinking maybe it's just the currents are way too fast for them to be able to stick in a normal place, like a, a normal nursery site. So maybe they're just laying their eggs somewhere else. They kind of drift in from other places. Uh, not exactly sure. And uh, we're seeing that some of the microstructures are aiding 
in attachment to the substrate sometimes, but not in all the species. So there's still a lot to be done to try and figure out what exactly is going on with these things. Um, but it's a lot of fun to try and figure it out and being able to see their, their textures and microstructures up close like this is one of the coolest things I've ever done. So, yeah. It can be really inspiring to look at microstructures like that to, you know, in terms of engineering um, efforts too, you know. Need, oh, need a better Velcro. The Velcro texture, yeah. <laughs> looking at the textiles and, and again, looking at the, the fluid dynamics, hydrodynamics. Um, it even has applications in, you know, underwater vehicles and things, you know, what, what really yeah. works uh, in high current situations, reducing drag and flow. So here's so this is, this is your that's, last. Slide. Yeah, that's all we have to just kind of give us a little overview of us. Um, so just a little bit about Miss. We have our website here. We also have all of the social media, including YouTube. And um, we're also, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email or contact us on any of the social media platforms. Like I said, we're a growing organization. We were just founded in June of this year, so we're brand new. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're growing our members. Uh, so if you're a woman of color and you're interested in shark science, please go to the website and uh, fill out the membership form so we can uh, add you as one of our, our members. And uh, we also accept friends of MIST, so people that don't identify as women of color that want to be part of the organization and part of what we're doing in increasing diversity and inclusion in marine science and shark science specifically. You can become a friend of MIST. We have a lot of partnerships with different organizations to provide research experiences and uh, workshops and things like that for students uh, through all works, all levels, uh, you know, kindergarten through grave, cradle to grave, I think is what they say. <laughs> and so we, um, we really welcome anyone that wants to be part of this, any teachers, educators, people with small children, anyone that's interested in sharks, we really encourage you to reach out to us and uh, we come in and we have members that talk to classrooms and we're raising money right now to do a summer camp uh, for kids to get them out in the ocean, experiencing life, diving in and uh, just getting to see <laughs> all these amazing animals up close and personal. And so right. that's all that we have. So, all right. So do I understand you don't discriminate if your face is too pale? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> we have something for everybody yes. yeah awesome great <laughs> so I, I love it we're gonna move on to um questions and remember that you can raise your hand and arnold will call on people that are raising their hand and take some live questions and let's see we're gonna go yeah, here to our i, I want to i want to be a part of this <laughs> that's this, good i do yeah, too it's good yeah, i think you you've got two two recruits right here <laughs> Yay, we'd love to have you. Shark friends. Shark friends. <laughs> All right. What so, was that, that uh, website, was that where the uh, Elasmobrank came in again? Oh, yeah. Can you can you explain the Elasmobrank? Yes. So all of our social media, like Jada mentioned, Elasmobranks uh, are the group of animals that are sharks, skates, and rays. So they're all of those uh, fish that are made up of cartilage that have strapped gills. So Elasma brank means strap gills. Uh, that's what it translates to, uh, which basically means that they have multiple gill slits versus, you know, fi fish that have like the one little covering, gill covering. Uh, these guys have all the slits. Mm -hmm. And so because we all are interested in Elasma branks, we have Miss Elasmo as our website and social media handles because we are miss and we study elasma branks miss elasma here we can see show it here <laughs> the gill there's, slits. A, there's the gill see? slits yeah got gill slits <laughs> yeah elasmo all right so for questions all right um lisa is asking what will the four of you do when you're finally able to get closer than six feet together uh, <laughs> in order to eat drink and talk sharks 
we need to hug first of all i need a hug from my girls i've been oh. like we've we've created this whole thing together and we've never been able to like see each other in person or have a drink or just you know nerd out about in the same <laughs> so that's the first thing i want is a big old hug from all of you <laughs> group hug group hug 100%. i have all this space hug. to give a hug yeah. <laughs> so this question looks like it might be uh for carly um we talked a little bit already about this but they're asking about how do you feel about the entertainment of cage diving and baiting sharks to attract them um it seems like it's not a very innocent behavior and it could be damaging to the sharks yeah so with cage diving i actually read a couple of papers on um they were looking at the behavior of white sharks in a cage diving area. And honestly, the biggest threat from that is towards the humans. So like if you're baiting sharks in an area that's like not very far away or that's too close to shore, not like where you can see the boat, but in an area where, you know, there's people around and everything. Honestly, I would say that that is a big threat as well. And from that, if a shark attacks a human, you know, that always goes back to the shark. So that's definitely a big thing. Um, but for like the baiting and everything, it definitely, if it's done very frequently, like sharks, like we said a little earlier, they've got big brains and they'll, they learn. So they will um, definitely start coming to a certain area a lot more often looking for food. They will start um, following boats around because they'll be like, oh, like, you put a bunch of smelly stuff in the water before you're probably going to do it again <laughs> um and unfortunately that could definitely lead to problems when it comes to bigger sharks that you would cage dive with like the first thing i always think of is white sharks because those are really popular to um cage dive with it's less of like it can definitely have a lot of physical injuries on the shark because you know I'm pretty sure we've seen a video of that white shark that got itself like jammed in the um, jammed in the cage. Yeah, so it's like anything like that can happen. And honestly, anything where we are um, having an effect on the animal, like we're doing something to make the animal do something, it's always it's not going to have a good effect on that animal in the long run. It might like seem cool, and you know it's. I mean, I won't lie, like going cage diving with white sharks sounds really cool. And like, I would love to do that. <laughs> but um, also just, you know, always keep in mind, like how is what you're doing actually beneficial to the sharks? Like, is it going to hurt them in the long run? Um, and like, honestly, there can be things where you can, you know, there's responsible tourism and make sure you're not actually harming the animals and things like that. But um, overall, I would say that always you know be conscious of <laughs> yeah affecting other animals yeah just always be yeah put the animals first really think, think like a shark think like a shark exactly. <laughs> and be respectful yeah. so, <laughs> yeah, there goes absolutely on. this do is we, arnold let's see do we have a couple of people who've had their hands raised let's see if we can try to get them in before the okay, end of the thanks, hour arnold. give them an opportunity so the first is abigail abigail if you unmute yourself you're welcome to speak to the team no way. This is awesome. Okay. So you guys all make me feel like I'm a kid again and I'm like watching the discovery channel and <laughs> I am an educator myself as specifically in the sciences. And I would love to know how you avoid uh, mentor fatigue. How do you balance both your work and also keeping kids really excited because I can hear the passion in your voice. And I know I'm my best when I'm speaking like that. And how do you do it? <laughs> You guys are always everywhere. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, therapy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, therapy. Yep, Carly hit the nail on the head there. Uh, yeah, self self care really important, and also setting boundaries. So, I set boundaries. I say these are the number of schools or classes or kids that I can connect with before I start feeling drained. And you can't pour out of an empty cup. So I set boundaries and I, whenever people contact me, I say, I'm sorry, I can't do it this month. I'm full on this month. Can we try and do something next month? And I just 
spread it out and people are usually, you know, if they want to talk to you, they want to talk to you. It's usually not time sensitive. And so I just don't try and stack too much on my plate and make sure that I'm around for the long run because I want to be able to help as many people as possible. And if I burn myself out, then there's a whole group of kids that I never reach because I worked myself too hard. <laughs> About our money. Yeah. I was going to say, Miss has taught me a ton of things in general that I didn't know before I graduated this May. One of them was how to say no to things <laughs> because I, I was like, I can do everything. I can do this an hour and then an hour later I'll do this. And then suddenly it's like 4 p.m. and I didn't eat. And my stomach is mad at me because I'm not taking care of myself. Um, and miss just learning how to say no and like realizing that while I would love to do absolutely every opportunity that someone emails me about, I can't physically do it without feeling drained. Yeah. Um, and like, it's super important to have that boundary with yourself and to recognize it and figure out where that is for you. Yeah, I would say I'm not a mentor. I'm brand new to grad school. It's week five. Um, but <laughs> I just, the whole learning how to say no thing is something I'm still working on, if we're being honest. Um, I, cause I want to do all the things and I want to tell people all the things and share the excitement. And I get so excited to just like nerd out about cool animals with people. And then I realized I did, I did this yesterday where Amani was like, yeah, I realized that it's 4 p.m. or whatever and I haven't eaten I did that yesterday and I jumped onto a meeting and I was like oh by the way can I just eat my spaghetti in front of you because realize that <laughs> it's it's past noon and I have not eaten a single thing yet today so yeah definitely just you know the self-care and taking a moment for yourself and it's okay to have like a weekend where you're like you know what I haven't been productive this weekend but that's okay because last week was crazy and I think that that should be more normalized like especially during the pandemic like it's so hard to be productive sometimes um and i'm the fatigue is insane during these times but like just being able to take a moment for yourself being able to be like hey you know what would love to talk to you but i can't right now i just don't i'm not in the headspace or i'm really booked or whatever it is just time management it's yeah. hard and i'm working <laughs> on it but i think we're all gonna get there <laughs> exactly that, that those are great. I think we have one other individual and I'm apologizing to how I pronounce his or her name. Anchal, you had your hand up for a long time. If you'd like to unmute yourself, we'd love to hear your question. Yeah. Hi. Um, can you, can everyone hear me? Sorry. Sure can. Okay, perfect. Um, it's pronounced Anchal, by the way. Okay. Um, and I just, I've been a fan of like all of you ever since you started this organization, um, especially so I'm a junior doing completing my undergrad right now in marine science. Um, so it's been pretty like confusing to try and navigate what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And like, I would love to do everything that, or would love to do everything that you guys um, are talking about, like your research and things like that. It's just not like, um, on the same timeline because of the pandemic. So what career advice would you guys give to like people like undergrads and students who are still working and wants to get into the field as soon as they can? My biggest piece of advice would be networking is literally the best thing that you could possibly do. Like going to office hours, um, whether that's in person or online, um, and I think honestly, networking might be, I don't want to say easier because nothing's easier during the pandemic, but it's now that everyone's familiar with, you know, like video chatting, it makes that a little bit, it takes the pressure off a little bit for, um, you know, doing that. But um, networking is super important. Going to office hours just to get to know your professors, see what kind of connections they have, see what kind of connections you can make, I think is super important because the way that I found my advisor now was the most roundabout, confusing, like 800 webs type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, I, it worked out. So it's those webs that kind of get you to where you need to go, even if it's super confusing and everywhere all at once kind of thing. But yeah, it's, I think networking is a huge, huge thing. And I would say, don't let imposter syndrome get to you. I think that that's something that a lot of people um, yes, I was I was about to ask about that too. 
yeah, people let that get the best of them. And I think it's important to know that you are not the only person with imposter syndrome. Everybody has it at some point, I feel like. Um, I know that I have had it. Um, and it's just, I say this every time someone asks me about it, but you have to be your hype man, be your own hype man and find other friends that will be your hype man. And like, be proud of yourself. I coded for four hours yesterday and finally got my function to work. And I was like, hey, good for you. You're smart. I'm proud of you kind of thing. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's definitely like having that positive mindset and that reinforcement over and over again in your own mind that you're doing this and you're really good at this and you're exactly where you're supposed to be is going to get you into the right mindset. And it will definitely kind of help squash that imposter syndrome. So being your own hype man and knowing that you worked hard to get here is super, super important. That's excellent. I was just going to add something really quick um, on top of what Jada said. For research, even emailing people in your department and asking if they have like data analysis research, because you can do that remotely and someone can teach you how to do that remotely. And like normally my advice is just get all the experience humanly possible. But it's so hard to do that when you're not in person. So even like emailing professors and saying, do you, are you working on a project right now that you have all this, these data sets and you need someone to help you go through them like on my laptop? That's, some, that's an experience that you can get. And data analysis and being able to analyze data is a really important skill to have. Right. It, it truly is a critical skill. And, yeah. you know, we've done so much work with, uh, with Esri, right, mm -hmm. and looking at how you can uh, really take data points and make them into, you know, really compelling stories and share with people mm -hmm. and look for patterns, looking for patterns, mm -hmm. um, change over time. And again, going back to, to doing research in, in, in books, either, you know, mm -hmm. physical books you can get your hands on or, or through the web and to, um, you know, be able to start making those comparative studies can, can take you a long way, even when you're kind of isolated from uh, your normal work. So I guess we're kind of at the at the top of the hour. Um, we're just going to take one last question from Sabrina, who wants to go through. And if everyone is asking every one of us, uh, what's your favorite shark book <laughs> or documentary? <laughs> Sharks of North America by Jose Castro. I love that book. That is an awesome book. And it has so much information in it. And it also has all the pictures of dermal denticles, which is the name for the shark scales. And it has micro CT scans of them. And it's so cool. And you should all get that book. I love it that you're excited about dermal denticles. <laughs> right? They're so cool. I could They're talk awesome. about them for an hour. <laughs> That's outstanding. <clears throat> all right, Jasmine. What about you? Oh, go ahead. So, Jump in there. Any sorry. of you? So I feel like this answer is going to just like loop back to everything that I said before. My favorite book is The Lady and the Sharks, <laughs> uh, which is Jeannie Clark, just yeah, all greatness. Just, I, yeah, that's the first shark book that I read that really made me go, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is like, I don't know. It was one of those defining moments where I was like, yep, and I want to be her. That's what I want. <laughs> And so, yeah, that's my favorite book. I can Excellent. imagine Jeannie wanting to be you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have two and I, I pulled them out. Um, this one, Michael Mueller's Sharks. Nice. Oh, right. Nothing in it but pictures. And it's just so wonderful to just admire the beauty of the animals. Um, I can't get enough of this when I'm having a bad day or I'm just like, you know what? I need a little inspiration. I'll just pull this out and take a look at it because it's just so nice to see how beautiful they are. Even though I haven't had the chance to go out in the field and have experience with them in the wild just yet, I know that I'm gonna get there. And this is a huge inspiration for that. Um, so thanks to my parents for getting that for me for my birthday. Um, <laughs> and there's this, The Shark Handbook by Dr. Greg Scomo. I think this is a really good like beginner book because it has, you know, the different groups of sharks and they'll tell you about the mackerel sharks and the carpet sharks and what different sharks are in those groups. The kind of like, you know, a little nesting doll situation of getting down to specific species. And um, it has tons of information on a bunch of different species, some well-known and some not super well-known. 
um, and it has scientific names in the back organized by common names. So that is super helpful because I need to learn my scientific names. Um, so yeah, I love this one for whether you're a beginner or you just are super interested in sharks and just want to learn a little bit more. I think this is a wonderful book. So yeah. Nobody said anything about Jaws yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a documentary oh, for the audience, just so you know, it's true. Yeah. And Carly? <laughs> oh my gosh. So the book that first comes to mind, most of my shark books are actually home in Michigan, now that I think of it. But um, I'm starting to read one, Shark Biology and Conservation, that just came out by Daniel Abel and uh, Dean Grubbs. And like, it is really good. It just goes into detail about everything. It's good for both scientists and educators because it will help you like learn, help you teach people the right things too. Um, but also I go back to the very first book that I ever read on sharks that literally is what got me hooked on sharks. It was, the name of the book was just Sharks. <laughs> and it was, and it was by, I'm pretty sure it's a National Geographic book, um, but it's just a thin paperback book, but like, there's just something about the wording. It like went into the dermal denticles really well. And that's also what got me hooked. Um, but it just had a lot of pictures and like, I'm a very visual person, but it was just so many pictures of these beautiful sharks. And I just immediately fell in love. So that'll always be my first love book, <laughs> just oh. sharks. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Um, we got everybody's answer. I think we got everybody, we, every, yeah. everybody answered us. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. We didn't so, get your answers. No. Oh, you yeah. don't know your oh, favorite I, no, movies. No, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, there was Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> and maybe you have read Peter Benchley's other book about, uh, about the elasmobranchs, mainly in this case, manta rays. Oh, the girl of the Sea of Cortez. That was my answer. Come on. Oh, well, I'll just see. <laughs> Go for it. That's all right. I don't know where I'm it is. Looking. We don't have it behind us here. But it's but, another awesome book. But I agree that Jeannie's love of sharks is contagious. And your love of sharks is contagious. Sharks and elasmobranchs and weird-looking creatures. Forams. <laughs> Yeah, for yeah. <laughs> all, all life, all life. And it's just so exciting to hear from you how it is you got on the path that you're on. And that, too, I think is contagious. I can't wait to see the reactions that we're going to get from this conver conversation. It's, it's, same here. I mean, I'm so grateful to all of you for joining us today. Yeah, I know you're busy and you're learning to say no to things. I'm so glad you said yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Go I, deep. Keep diving in. It's it's one thing. I mean, it, I think it's really important to bite off more than you can chew. Yeah, and you have then, to shake it just like a shark. And, and then chew it. <laughs> but when you start to choke, then you have to re <laughs> rethink how much you can actually bite take on. on yeah but just come back around <laughs> right yeah take another bite take another bite yeah. tomorrow but thank you everyone um and before we go today i just wanted to say uh, deep thanks to our guests and to our producers and partners the ocean elders and medley media and to everyone in the community that is keeps showing up and joining us um week after week over these months um dive in is really starting to feel like home for us and, and hopefully for our guests and all of you as well. And we appreciate everyone. Um, dive in season two will be coming up in January. So if you have uh, topics or guests to suggest to us, please, please do suggest that. Um, we're going to be joined next week for the last of Sharktober with Vicki Vasquez. And uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, this this episode and past episodes are going to be available on the Ocean Elders channel of YouTube. And we need to remind everyone before we go to take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it, because they do. It does. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. 
Thank, thank you so you much. We'll right. see you again. Thank underwater. You. Underwater. Let's go diving. <laughs> Let's go. Yes. And that's hug. a real invite. Hug. Hug. We'll, we'll hug underwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye.